obviously digital design is your first choice of console. Uh, what would be your second choice? And I can answer that pretty easily. I, I would say my second choice would probably be an analog console. <laughs> okay. Right. And, and here's why. Um, I mean, for many years, I, I had the opportunity to use all the digital consoles out there and did at one point or another. Probably, I, I haven't used X L eight yet. Uh, I haven't used the very latest uh, <laughs> Soundcraft yet. Yeah. Boy, you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, very. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure it's great. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm sure it's fantastic. I mean, I'm a big Minus fan. I used Minus for years, so I'm sure it's really good. Uh, but here's why I would say that. Um, first and foremost is just the amount of processing power that I have here compared to what I would even have on XL8, okay? I mean, I, I come from a studio background. I do, I've done over 3,000 live shows, and I know what processing I need to do my, my job. I have an approach, a certain approach that I do in certain styles of music, and this is the only, console, the only digital console that offers the processors that I want to use, okay? Short of that, I'm gonna move back to analog and use the processors there. Yeah. And the other piece of the puzzle here is that it has delay compensation in it. That's the other really biggie for me. That's why I did not spec any of the other digital consoles previous to menu on my tours. Because, you know, if you want to do compression malting, you want to do upwards compression, you know, all of these studio tricks that we use, this is the only console I can do that on. Okay, so short of that, I've moved back to analog. And lastly, it's just the sound quality of it. I haven't heard any other digital console, although I haven't worked on XL8 yet. And I think it's right there with You know, I, I, I went to the conference for, well, the training for the Soundcraft board, yeah. the new one, and I asked the guy about the delay compensation. He didn't know how to answer it. Right. And well, they, they had no answer. idea, because I think that he designed the only ones that actually... Yeah, I, I know that, I think there is some delay compensation in the XL8 as well. Yeah, in the XL8, yeah. yeah. does. Uh, which is probably pretty proficient. I mean, you know, for a couple hundred thousand dollars, it better be in there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I can buy a Ferrari for it. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, really, again, that's part of the thing for me. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm at a position in my career where I can spec any console I want to spec. Yeah. But with this, I just went and bought one. You know, I don't want to go out and spend two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars on an XL8 and not know what the long-term path for that console is. Yeah. And also be limited on the processing, etc. It may sound great, don't get me wrong. No, it's huge. It's very uncomfortable in a sense. Yeah. It's very nice and a lot of lights. And but I, I, I should mention to you this, when we talk about <laughs> the, the sound quality issue, this yeah. is always an argument. I've talked about this on forums. When you're talking about mixing, sound quality, and it's going to sound weird, is only part of the formula. I, if I have input to output, great sound quality, but I can't mix the show, what good is it for me? Okay? I mean, you, the ability to, especially in today's music, as, as complex as music production has become, I gotta have the tools to be able to mix that kind of music. And it's not just about input to output. Sound quality. That's, that's important, don't get me wrong. But it's not the only measuring stick. You know? So when people say, well, that console sounds better than that one, well, great, can I, can I mix on it? You know? So and I think the digital world has really suffered from that, you know, where we've had digital consoles come out with all of this functionality, and, and I got caught with it the first few times I worked on PM1D. I mean, it was just, you know, in the very early days, it was just like, oh my gosh, you got so handcuffed just trying to operate the console that you did not mix the show. So I, I, I really wanted, you know, when we were working on this, we spent a great deal of energy and time trying to make sure the user interface was usable for somebody. So they wasn't going to impede your ability to mix the show, it could actually help you mix the show better. So in answer to the question, did you design or I got to go analog at this point until I try to XL8. You have to try but you know, I'll say this about XL8, and, you know, for as great a piece of engineering as I think that probably is under the hood, you know, just the financial piece of it is going to make it really, really hard to fit into certainly concert sound models. Especially this market. Yeah. yeah. Well, even the U.S. market, it's going to be an issue, folks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll give you an example. You know, if 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 I was on Tom Petty again, if I was still mixing Tom Petty, and I went back to the, the management and said, you know what, we're going to switch over to XL8 on the house monitors. It would almost double the cost of their rental. 
for the PA system. Now, if I'm going to do that, it better sound twice as good. Because the management and their accountant is going to come back and say, wait a minute, why, why are we spending twice as much money over the course of the tour? I mean, they're going to ask those questions. You better have an answer for them. So it may be a great piece of technology, but in terms of its business model, where it's going to fit in the industry, if they're going to try to sell it in the concert sound, they're going to have a, a tough road to hold. You know? I mean, the elite acts will have it. I mean, if they want to have it, and I'm sure sound companies, some of the bigger sound companies will definitely have one. The rental companies will have one to rent. But as far as it making some deep penetration where it's being used universally, I just don't see it happening at that price point. I may, I may be completely off well, base, but I don't see it. Do you agree? No. I agree with that. Nobody's going, nobody's going to rent it. It's too expensive. Yeah, it's too expensive. Well, and if you, if the, I mean, if you take the sound company position, if I'm a sound company owner and I own one now, I, I, I'm stuck with two choices. I gotta, I gotta rent it out for a very low price to compete with these consoles and try to get everybody to fall in love with it and then raise the price back up. Which is dangerous, because yeah. then you can, you know, you can push away your clients. Yeah. Or I just got to say, I got to rent it at this much money and, and take it as I can. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tough position. I, I mean, whenever I saw the, the price of that, I thought, yeah, going to have a hard time with that. Yeah. 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 And I, I'll tell you, I, if, uh, right now, I think if, if I was them, I would be really scared of SP7. The digital SD7. Because it's going to have all the functionality and a bit more of XLA for almost half the price. So, I mean, that's a very sexy, very well designed product. It's going to be good. It's going to put some pressure on them. Well, actually, there's there's plan for them. I mean, that's something we could talk about here. I believe there are plans for them to run plugins on the FPGA on that console. Okay, but keep this in mind, you know, and, and this is always the kind of the hidden thing about plugins and what you have to remember. The TDM plug-in architecture has been in existence now for 10 or 15 years. And all of the third-party manufacturers have written plugins to run on Windows XP Macintosh. Okay, and you know, obviously they have to be, you know, they can run on the menu as well. If you, talk, if you talk about now incorporating a new CPU platform, it's not that you're going to be able to take all of these plugins and run it on there. All of these companies will have to code their plugins to run on your device. That's going to take an enormous amount of time and energy. You know? So while they may run on there, they're not going to run the same. Okay, so you know a plugin is not just another plugin. You know they're, they're specific. Like in the Pro Tools world. Even though it's the same plugin, it's the same Fairchild plugin, or it's the same 1176 plugin, when we went to Intel Macintosh, all of those plugins had to be recoded, you know, to work on the Intel Macs. So the ones that work on Motorola Macs will not work on the Intel Macs. Okay, so, you know, you have to have that development as a manufacturer. You have to have that partnership with all of those manufacturers. You know, Bomb Factory, Focusrite, Eventide, you know, to get them to build for you. That's why you won't probably see TDM plugins running on a PM1D natively anytime soon. No, they have they their own, what, what are they called? The, uh, the X. Yeah, they, and that, those are all built in house. For Yamaha. Okay, so that's why this is such a huge, huge advantage, really, in many ways. And you can even take that one step further. I was showing guys how to do this uh, yesterday, where, you know, if you consider the ramifications of plugins being used in the studio, you know, you have an artist now who is using plugins. On their mixing or the tracking, they can take those presets from there and bring them right in on the menu. I mean, it's a huge, huge advantage. And let me tell you something: it speaks directly to the artist when they know that they can do that. I, I, in my, all my 30 years of mixing live sound, I've never seen the artist become so engaged and interested in what we're using at front of house and monitors until this console came out. Because all of a sudden, they could connect the dots a little bit. They could say, "Wait a minute." I can use the plugin that I used on the, in the recording. I can use here. I can hear it in my ear mix. Yeah, it's a done deal. Now, now they're stepping up and saying we need to use that console. Whereas before they would never care. Yeah. 
they, they didn't know. You know, it's like Yamaha yeah, by the side, I've never even heard of them. Okay. So, you know, talk about consoles, that, that's part of the love I have for this whole line of consoles. It, it transcends both sides of the industry and I just think it sounds great. Okay. All right, that's question one. <laughs> Uh, do you still consider using analog outboard processors, like uh, valve preamps and compressors? Um, not as much. Not as much. I, I mean, I, uh, because I trust all the emulations that happen here, and again, it comes back from using them in the studio. You know, I, I'll back up a little bit with this and, and try to put some more uh, context on it. You know, I, I said this in a recent webinar, and it really stirred up the dust, but I'm going to say it again here. One of the things you have to remember about digital design and live sound products is that this company, and only this company, as a live sound company, has been held to a completely different standard compared to their live sound competitors. I mean, with Pro Tools, they have been slugging it out for about 15 years now with SSL, Neve, API, Euphonics. As a recorder, they've been slugging it out with Studer, Analog. And they've survived all that. You know, the industry has accepted it as, as a viable replacement for some of those gold, golden analog circuits and sounds. All of that DNA comes right into venue. You know? So when we talk, you know, when I, when I tell somebody, hey, it, this is studio quality audio, and they get to hear it for the first time, they go, okay, okay, I, I get what you're saying now. You know? So the same thing applies to all the plugins. You know, all of them have been developed and used in the biggest studios, the biggest mastering houses in the world. So I trust these. I, I know that these work. And I've done my own comparisons in the studio where I've taken 1176 and a plugin and kind of compared them to see if they do the same. You know, and and it's close enough. You know, I'd rather really have I'd rather really have in plugin form a Fairchild that is 80% of what a real Fairchild is and be able to use it anywhere I want to use it as opposed to trying to lug a, a $30,000 compressor around with me on the road. And I would do it. I, if I had the opportunity to do it, I absolutely would do it. I mean, I was known for doing it in the United States. I would just bring racks of tube gear and processors out and use them. It's like, hey, a good sound is a good sound. This is how we get it right here. I can't do it with a DBX 160. You know, it's got to be this box drove the sound company absolutely crazy because they would have to go get me all this gear you know, that they were doing. And, and the proof was in the pudding, you know, the show sounded great. Okay? All right, so what was the question again? Yeah, you know, the other, um, so while I do consider using it here, I, I don't right now. And here's the two reasons why. Because I love having the snapshots tied, or the plugins tied to my snapshots. Outboard gear, I can't do that. And it does, the outboard gear, for the most part, I don't think sounds better enough to eliminate it from the snapshot process. Okay? Uh, the other reason is, especially if we're talking about using different preamps, you know, ahead of the stage rack, et cetera, at some point, you know, you can't get in behind the preamp. It's still got to go through this preamp. So you may have something really, really great sitting out here, but it's still got to go through this preamp unless you're going to go really high in preamp, really high in digital converter and come in digital here. Okay. Which to me it's okay, okay, if I have something that I really, 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 really gotta have that sound on, then I'll do it. But the, the downside to it is that I give up part of the virtual sound check workflow if I do that. I lose control of the preamp in the virtual sound check workflow, which I don't want to do. Right now uh this is uh digital make a a tube preamp for the front of or the rack. Yeah. For the stage rack. Do you think you're going to make something like that? Uh, no. No? No. No, I, I don't see any need to do it. Because, and this, you know, we're going to, we can go down a long path here if we want to go down there. Because, you know, part of what happens, you know, just putting a tube in something doesn't make it warmer sounding. <laughs> in fact, if it's, if it's working at the lower end of its operational scale, it can have a better transient response than a, than a solid state circuit. The way you get warm out of a tube circuit is by overdriving it. Okay, that's what creates the harmonic bloom that we like. Well, 
Do you really want to have an overdriven? Is, is there any any opportunity for the digital to overdrive that preamp to create a little more? Well, you can't do it live. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me just as a topology. You know? And I'll give you a little background on the preamps here because I think, honestly, I think that's our hidden secret, which is our preamp design. This preamp design was taken from uh, um, a chip design that was very popular in the 70s and 80s in vintage console design, in the memes and the SSLs. It's from a 1061. Wow. That's the chip design. And, and as it just happened to happen in, in history, when we got ready to start designing this, the same company, Audio Devices, the same company, released a really low noise version of that exact same chip. And we thought, man, we've hit the golden goose here. So that's the central point of this preamp. And then add to that that there are no electrolytic caps in this design. It's all ribbon caps, all film caps in this. And it's a really, really high five sound of preamp. Okay, so it's, it's part of the design. I mean, we can have great converters, whatever, you know. And if you have a terrible sounding preamp, you're just converting a bad preamp sound. So it's, it's all got to start right there. So I, I think our secret is great preamp design, well, way, way above average A to D conversion, and then 48 bit mixing. Those, those two things in combination make for great preamp design. Okay? Everybody buying that? You believe what I'm saying? Yes. This preamp is more like a smoothie preamp. Yeah, like a live sound console preamp. It's it's based on a. I'd say at its core is a studio design. Yeah. More like ATM. I didn't. Well, I'd say from the the position of having the film capacitors involved, it, that that alone makes it sound much more like a discrete circuit. Okay. But at the core of it, it's probably probably closer to even SSL. I, I, if I had to say that it's like I did when we were developing the console, I did tons of comparisons, you know, listening comparisons, blind tests, comparing this preamp to every preamp I can get my hands on. And I think it comes the closest to the Grace preamps. That's what I think it sounds the most like. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really transparent. I mean, it's, you know, and, and I think that throws people off at times the first time they hear it. I mean, it's so transparent. And really, so void of any, you know, harmonic color like we see in an analog circuit that they, they kind of go, "Wow, that's you know, a little stale sounding." Maybe <coughs> as, they, as they start to work with it, they kind of realize, "Wow, this thing is just gooey. I can do anything I want to do with it and, and, and manipulate the audio with it." I mean, it's incredible headroom and so. So that's my take. Okay. 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 Uh, so you know, the other piece I would say about you know the other pre's, et cetera, you know, where I might use it. Uh, with this console, again, and I'll probably convert it to digital to do it, <clears throat> is if I'm doing things like maybe I'm, I'm going to work on things that are outside the scope of virtual sound check. Maybe it's room mics for my recording, maybe it's uh, an ambient mic sitting at the front of the house, things like that. You know, I might, I might push those out and compress them before I actually convert them to digital and, and print them hot, you know. Because remember, our record path here is right after the deconversion. So maybe maybe for room mics and stuff I would do it with them. It's really all that's done virtual sound check for me. Uh, here's a good one. I like this one. What do you think about the formula? Bad musicians, good sound engineer equals good music. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. All right. Now here's how it goes. Uh, bad music. Regardless of whether, whether it's engineered good or bad, it's still bad music. Yeah. Okay? It's just good sounding bad music. <laughs> okay? But, you know, great music will survive any kind of treatment, any kind of production. Great music can sound terrible, and you still kind of get it. You know, you still understand it. Okay? And I think that's never been truer for record production. You know, you can... I, I believe me, I've mixed my share of really, really bad demos and made some really good sounding bad demos. You know, they, they go nowhere. You know, it still has to be music. And, uh, you know, that's actually going to play into one of these other questions, so I'll just wait on it. Uh, point source or line array? <coughs> uh, line array, definitely for me. Uh, D and B is probably my favorite. Maybe very close with VDOS. Either one of those two, I think, are the best out there. Meyer would be in there somewhere. Certain, certain Meyer products would be in there somewhere. Uh, but for the most part, I'm, I'm all about the line array. 
I think it gives the, the best far field phase response of any PA system going today. You give me, although having said that, give me a horizontally arrayed PA that can provide that kind of phase response and that kind of ability to cover a geometry properly, especially in the vertical domain, maybe I go back to horizontal. But I haven't seen any, any horizontally arrayed PAs that even come close to being able to do that. I think one of the, you know, aside from the sound quality and the phase, one of the hidden, hidden advantages of line array is being able to adjust in the vertical aspect, be able to cover high distances. It's almost impossible with the horizontally array PA. You have to just fly it ridiculously high. So line array, line array, line array for me. <laughs> Uh, in order to be a good sound engineer, would you recommend a good degree of theory or enough practice? Um, I think both, but I, I, at the core of all of it is uh, experience. Okay? And even students that I see coming into schools, a lot of times what I recommend to them is to go out and work in the field for a little while. Get some sense of what it is and then go to school. Because it's it's dark, it's audio. We can't see it. We have no idea what's really really happening, you know. Uh, but get some sense of what the business is like a little bit, and then go to school if you need it. And it, and I always try to say, you know, try to get some set in your mind. Are you going to be? Do you want to be a mixer? Do you want to be a system designer? Do you want to be a sound designer? You got to pick. You know, kind of one of those disciplines, and then go after it. You know. And and. For my money, just through my years of experience, the people that I've seen be the most successful as mixers are people that have some sort of musical background. They think music. They don't think electronics and decibels. They think music. And you know, we were sitting here listening to music today. Uh, I don't know if you were reading the captions, etc. But it's you know, that to me is at the core. If you're going to be a mixer, of how you should be thinking. You know. You can't use one approach for mixing all styles of music. You've got to go back and listen and dig into mixes and understand what makes music tick, what makes it work, and then, then come up with your own approach to do that, whether it's live or in the studio. That's what makes you a great mixer. It has nothing to do with learning how to operate the console or learning how to operate that console or knowing how to operate all the consoles. It has nothing to do with it. It's about it's the ability to listen and discern and understand that this is what's trying to be presented musically and this is going to be my tool to do that. Yeah. Okay? Understand that? Okay. Everybody buy that? <laughs> yeah. And let's see, what would you want to say to the new generations? Yeah, again, I would say, you know, there's so much technology out there at our disposal. So much. I mean, I think about what was available when I started in audio. I, and I'm going to date myself a little bit here. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But on my first studio jobs, my first mixing job, there were no computers, there was no digital anything. You know, one tape machine, one console, closet full of microphones, maybe a plate reverb. That was about it, you know? Yeah, maybe not that far back. <laughs> But you know, since then, I mean, if you think about all the the amount of technology that has been put in play, and then you add to that that all the technology that was in play a long time back is still valid, people still want to use it. If you're a new person coming into this, you just kind of got to go, whoa! You know, how am I possibly going to learn all this? But the answer is to learn your approach. Don't worry about learning the gear. Obviously, you got to know what a compressor does, what a microphone does, the difference between condenser and dynamic, and you know, blah 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 blah. You have to know those things. But at the core of all of it has to be your approach. How do I approach mixing or creating or recording that style of music? If that's not at the core of it, you're going to fall down. You're absolutely going to fall down at some point. Yeah. So I would say to the new generations. The gear is important. The music is way, way more important. Okay? Does that answer your questions? Thank you. Cool.